May the words of my mouth, meditations of our hearts be ever acceptable in your sight, Christ, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Something strange is happening. There is a great silence on earth today, a great silence and stillness. The whole earth keeps silence because the king is asleep. The earth trembled and is still because God has fallen asleep in the flesh and he has raised up all who have slept ever since the world began. God has died in the flesh and hell trembles with fear. He has gone to search for our first parent as for a lost sheep, greatly desiring to visit those who live in darkness and in the shadow of death. He has gone to free from sorrow the captives, Adam and Eve, he who is both God and the son of Eve. I am your God who for your sake have become your son. Out of love for you and for your descendants, I now command all who are held in bondage to come forth, all who are in darkness to be enlightened, all who are sleeping to arise. I order you, O sleeper, to awake. I did not create you to be held a prisoner in hell. Rise from the dead, for I am the life of the dead. Rise up, work of my hands. You were created in my image. Rise. Let us leave this place, for you are in me, and I am in you. Together we form only one person, and we cannot be separated. Something strange is happening. I have loved this early 5th century Easter homily since I first encountered it. In part, because Epiphanius, Bishop of Cyprus, is trying to answer the question of what exactly it was that Christ did between the moment of his death and his resurrection three days later. It was not enough to simply accept the mystery. Something strange is happening, and Epiphanius will leave no rhetorical stone unturned in his desire to offer an explanation. Awake, O sleeper. This is good news for both the living and the dead. It presents our Christian hope that death is not the end of the story, as a hope and a truth made available and accessible to all. You are in me and I am in you. Together, we form only one person and we cannot be separated. And that is something we need to hear on the seventh Sunday of Easter. A Sunday that contains no resurrection appearances a Sunday in which we are left with words, but not the flesh. And so on this su seventh Sunday of Easter, we are reminded that nothing can separate us from the love of God and that this is a happy Easter indeed. So why, why is it that I'm offering you an Easter sermon by Epiphanius of Cyprus about the harrowing of hell on the Sunday after the Ascension. Isn't it old news at this point? The resurrection of Christ, the empty tomb, is it not old news? It's not old, but good. Good news indeed. And it is news we need to hear alongside the disciples because we, like they, are in the in-between times. The in-between times. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Note the shift in tenses in this memorial acclamation. 
Christ will. It is a future to which we look forward, not a past which we remember. So what do we do while we wait? While we wait. This seventh Sunday of Easter, in this in-between liminal time of waiting, is not unlike Holy Saturday. Except this time, it's not the grief of death, but fear and anger. Fear and anger born of our perceived abandonment that we must face. The Christian mystic John of the Cross speaks to this most beautifully. Why, since you wounded this heart, don't you heal it? And why, since you stole it from me, do you leave it so and fail to carry off what you have stolen? Why? The anguish and the despair is palpable. All hope has been fulfilled. And now, for what do we hope? During that particular Holy Week, the one that preceded the joy of the resurrection, the disciples knew that Jesus' death was coming. They saw it happen in human terms. They knew what it was to grieve. Death was not new to them, nor was it unexpected. There were comforting rituals. There were traditions to observe. There were clear sides. Those who killed and those who mourned. Those who took and those who gave. But now? Now Jesus simply leaves? Having overturned death itself, Jesus is taken up physically into the clouds, not in some comprehensible moment of death, but in a transcendent moment of bliss, a transcendent moment that leaves his friends staring up into the clouds, wondering perhaps if they've been ghosted by the one they loved the most. He doesn't call, he doesn't text. It's like he never was. And in this moment comes what the mystics might call the dark night of the soul. That time in which we fear ourselves forsaken, abandoned to the world, abandoned because we don't understand what is happening. We don't understand what is going on in these heavens of ours, of God's, and we don't understand. And we can only wonder. We can wander and live in the midst of the unknown and the uncertain. Now, there are 10 long days between our observance of the ascension of Christ and our reception of the spirit at Pentecost. 10 long days. And while the scriptural depiction of Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father informs our creed, it does not necessarily fill in the gaps. The gaps that make up the day-to-day and the moment-to-moment living that we must do while we wait and watch and weep and wonder. So, While our speculation may be about the something strange that is happening, what exactly does Jesus do at the right hand of the Father? The scripture that is appointed for this in-between Sunday is not about some transcendent heaven. It is instead focused on the here and the now of the in-between. What the Reverend Suzanne Guthrie describes as an imposed pause. The anticipation of the promise, the flash of insight before the work of Pentecost begins. The church, not quite ready to be the church, is asked to go deeper into love these 10 days of ascension tide. 
were asked to practice loving in dark faith without the bodily presence of the resurrected Christ. To practice loving during the dark night of the soul. The practice of love is Christian practice. It is Christian praxis. It is what we do while we wait in hope, while we wait in fear, while we wait together. We are asked to practice love. What does it look like? For the first disciples, as described in the Acts of the Apostles today, it meant coming up with a structure that would support the growth of a nascent community. I can almost imagine the minutes from that meeting. Okay, so Jesus ascended into heaven and um, Jude isn't with us anymore. We need to elect a new member to the board. So, Can I get a motion to use the system of casting lots in conjunction with prayer to elect from our slate? You know, let's figure out our governance system and elect a new member of the board. That's one way of practicing love and it's been heartily taken on by the church. Then, of course, there's the author of the first letter of John showing us another way of practicing love. Clarifying the Christology of early Christians and setting standards for Christian formation in community. Creating a pedagogy and a scope and sequence for Christian learning. These teachings are true. Those teachings are false. false, And true teachings can be discerned by the presence of love for one another. To quote the author of the first letter of John, God is love. We should love one another as Christ commanded of us. Indicative of this love, mutual care and support. The tangible fruit of the spirit is love and care for one another. And so if somebody is not loving and caring for this community and each other, then they are not giving you the true teachings of the spirit. The pursuit of the common good is central to a common faith. Formation, another way of practicing love. Learning to discern the true from the false, the good from what is evil. Pragmatic guidelines in the face of holy mystery and hence Christianity. Pragmatic guidelines in the face of holy mystery. Is is there anything else you can think of that is more human? To create a structure and a form to hold that which we could never hope to understand. And in so doing, create a boundless container for the gift of the spirit that is to come. Human beings, all of us, need structure and practices and disciplines that reinforce the why of our faith. The why that is God's love for us. The why that is Christ's care for us. The why that is the power within. The power within us to intervene for love of one another. I abide in you. And you abide in me. Intervention for love. Our testimony for the in-between times. To be a Christian is to be willing to intervene for love. To be a Christian means to look at the world in all its pain. And to intervene for love. To be a Christian means to act on behalf of all nations and races and intervene 
for love, for love of God, for love of Christ, for Christ's love of all of us. And so our Christian praxis is to intervene, to intercede on behalf of those for whom we fear, to intercede as Christ did on earth, feeding, healing, and liberating. Our faith in action becomes the answer to Jesus's prayer on our behalf, a prayer we hear uttered on the seventh Sunday of Easter in the good news that has been given to us. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. That is Jesus's petition on behalf of all of us. Christ prays for you. And what a wonder that is when we are wondering how Christ will show up. So in this in-between time, let us respond to this prayer with the action of love, with the practice of love, with acts of care and contrition that demonstrate to the world that we practice the way of love, the way of Christ in this world. And that we need not fear being left behind because we have been made whole and holy in Christ. Amen. <laughs>